basic engineering education in our aerospace department and also in the research. He's also an active member of our Maryland Robotics Center, Rotorcraft Center, um, Neuroscience and Cognitive Science Graduate Training Program, and also brain educator. So he's involved in many different things. Um, he's the recipient of many prestigious awards, including uh, the prestigious PKs Award to NSF. And today he's going to tell us a little bit about his exciting research. So, no Thank you. Thanks, Razor, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation to uh, speak to you guys today. It's a real honor and privilege to do so, so thanks for coming. Um, I want to talk about one aspect of research in my lab here uh, having to do with bio-inspired soft robotics. So we have robotics students here, I assume. Raise your hand. Don't be shy. People working in robotics, just a couple. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully this is of interest to, to everyone. Um, I'll just say a word um, about my lab here. If my computer wakes up, let's try that again. Um, so just to say a few words before I get started on today's talk, um, as I said, this is just one aspect of the research that goes on in my lab. Students in my lab get trained in dynamics and control. Um, I teach a nonlinear control class in the aerospace engineering department. Um, in fact, uh, it's quite similar, uh, maybe a little bit more applied than the nonlinear control class taught in ECE that some of you may have taken. We do a lot of work historically. We've done a lot of work on mobile sensor networks and adaptive sampling um, and have had a history of looking at issues related to biocomplexity and more recently bio-inspired engineering. Um, we have support from a number of federal agencies about uh, 17, I, I tallied this up for my own benefit, about 17 students in the lab at the moment, and we're proud to, uh, to have had um, uh, nine former members who are now tenure track faculty. So this is an outline, a pictorial outline of today's talk. Um, this is looking at three projects in bio-inspired soft robotics. And we got started with FISH, my background's in underwater vehicles, and I'll tell you a little bit about the PKs project. I wonder um, if it's possible to dim the lights in the front. Um, thanks, Becky. So we'll start out with, uh, with talking about fish. This was our first foray into soft robotics. Um, and we got interested in it because um, of uh, interest in, in fish-inspired sensing, fish-inspired propulsion. In fact, I gave a talk here a couple of years ago on one of our um, sensing-related projects. Today, I'll focus more on the propulsion aspects. Um, and that was sort of our foot in the door into the soft robotics. Um, and we got interested um, in caterpillar uh, locomotion. Caterpillars are um, obviously ground vehicles, not underwater vehicles. So that was a point of hesitation for me being an aerospace engineer. Uh, but nonetheless, there's some interested distributed control opportunities having to do with the many legs and the multi-legged locomotion problem. And so that, that got us uh, motivated to study that. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. And then thirdly, hopefully we have time, um, I want to tell you about a newer project having to do with starfish-inspired um, locomotion. And so this is a, both the Caterpillar and the starfish grants are collaborative grants, multi-university grants. Um, and so with, with, uh, with the starfish uh, project, I'll tell you about, a little bit about the work that's going on here at Maryland. Um, in order to achieve this, this capability. And here we're back in the underwater domain, although I guess it can come out of the water as well. Um, so I'll try to give you a little bit more detail. Before I do that, I want to acknowledge um, the work that, uh, the students whose work I'm presenting today. Not just their work, but in, in actually in almost all instances, their, their slides. They're, they helped me prepare these slides. And, um, and so we've got uh, my postdoc, Will, here working on starfish, Jin Song. And I, just raise your hand if, if you're here. I see, I see a couple of my students. Helen's working on caterpillars, Brian. And Simran is an undergrad. These are the former members of the lab who've moved on. Faitian's now a professor at George Mason. Julie's a professor at Salisbury University. And Brian got a prestigious NDSEG fellowship and is now at Stanford in his first semester. Um, so we've had a really good track record students working on these projects. And I want to thank them for all their all contributions. 
Um, and so without further ado, this is the first project, uh, Bioinspired Propulsion Sensing and Control for a Novel Underwater Vehicle. So here's the basic um, sort of mile-high view of this project. We're interested in creating a novel autonomous underwater vehicle, so a new platform, unlike a traditional propeller-driven uh, vehicle, that is capable of agile maneuvers and stable swimming motion in a dynamic environment. We're drawing upon tools uh, ranging from aerospace engineering, nonlinear control and estimation, and fluid dynamics to solve the problem of closed-loop control of a flexible airfoil in flowing water using distributed pressure sensing. And the key attribute that I want to highlight here, it's a little bit hard to see, is that the, the, the design of this vehicle uses internal actuation. Um, this is a technology that's common in, in, in satellites and in aerospace industry, um, using internal rotors to control the angular momentum of the vehicle. And the key idea is that the flexibility of this vehicle um, will convert the angular momentum control into propulsion through flapping, efficient inspired swimming type motion. And so that was the concept um, that we wanted to explore in this project. And so this is actually an image of where we are in this project process. Um, and again, I apologize if it's a little bit hard to see, um, but this is, this is our vehicle now. Um, it's it's um, about a foot long um, vehicle, and it's uh, made of molded rubber, and I'll walk you through the fabrication steps that we, that we have. It has an internal motor that, that drives a rotor back and forth, which through conservation of total angular momentum, creates the flapping motion and, and propels it through the water. Here's an earlier prototype with a little piece of foam on it, swimming in our neutral buoyancy facility. If, you, if you're not aware, we have uh, the largest underwater research facility on a university campus, and the only one that I'm aware of equipped with underwater motion capture, and that's just over uh, near the Xfinity Center. So getting to the shape of the vehicle, one of the reasons that why we like this particular shape, it's known as a Tchaikovsky foil or airfoil shape, is because there's a nice, math, nice mathematical framework not only to generate the shape via conformal mapping of a disk in the complex plane, but also to model the fluid flow past it. Again, coming back to the aerospace engineering theme, this, this is a, this, the, these are the fluid dynamics that our students learn. Um, and we can leverage for this project even though we're working in the underwater domain. And so these, these parameters, varying these various parameters, um, um, produces different um, sh resulting shapes. So our first uh, option for fabrication was a little bit ambitious, but we, th we decided we wanted to 3D print it. And you can see the CAD here has some holes in the side, and the holes are for pressure sensors that allow us to measure the um, the, uh, the water pressure at each of those pores and thus interpret things like angle of attack and flow speed past those pores. And again, I presented on that work a few years ago, so I'm not going to dwell too much on it, though I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but today I want to talk more about the propulsion aspects, which is, our, which is enabled by the flexibility of this uh, platform. This is a Tango black material uh, printed using an object printer in the basement of Martin Hall. Um, some of you may have used that uh, facility for your own work. Um, this is a NinjaFlex uh, material that is also an option. But neither of these materials provided um, the, the flexibility that we need for this project, although our hope is that we will be able to leverage this uh, technology for future designs. So instead, what we're still doing here is still 3D printing um, a mold and then using rubber, silicon rubber. Um, and you see here the process of mixing the rubber, pouring it into the mold, um, and utilizing um, a vacuum to remove all the bubbles from the rubber um, and allowing it to set. And so we can, we can pour it into our 3D cast, and the, and the material we're using right now is actually called dragon skin. And that's, that's the white material that you saw in the photograph. Uh, so this is, this is the current iteration of the fish, uh, including the pressure sensors and LED lights. Um, although we've primarily focused on pressure sensing, um, up until now uh, we do anticipate incorporating um, computer vision for, uh, for scenarios involving multiple fish. That's the vision that we fill the neutral buoyancy tank with 
uh, a bunch of uh, robotic fish in order for um, experiments involving pursuit or, or schooling behavior. At any rate, at this point, the lights are just an indication that the robot is on. Um, it, has, it has the Joukowsky foil uh, silhouette when viewed from above, which allows us to level, uh, leverage the potential flow theory to model the flow past the foil even when it's bent. Um, and from the side view, we adopted this, this uh, bluegill silhouette. So it, from the side view, it has an actual fish uh, shape. With regard to the dynamics, we have a number of state variables. Um, if it were a rigid body, then it would have three degrees of freedom uh, in the plane, the position, and the orientation. But to that, we add the camber, or the degree of bending in the fish. Re remember, as, as the internal rotor rotates back and forth, it generates a shape change in the fish, which we model in our state space uh, equations. And so this is a description of those equations which include the torque inputs provided by the rotor. And the idea is that we prescribe the angular velocity of the rotor as a sinusoid, and we can, we can simulate the resulting effect on the, um, the propulsion of the fish and its, its position in the plane. And so the first control design that we did with these dynamics involved a very basic um, uh, objective, which was to control the flow speed relative to the surrounding water. Here's a, an image. Unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to get the movie into Google Slides um, because it was embedded in a PowerPoint document. But this is, uh, this is a movie of, uh, of the fish uh, swimming into the flow. This is collected in our lab, and this is a flowing water facility. And the idea is that by controlling the flapping frequency and or amplitude, we can regulate the swimming speed of the fish. I should mention that this, this particular fish is not driven by an internal reaction wheel. It's driven by a motor that's suspended on air bearings that are aligned with the, a long stream direction, so that if in the absence of any flapping, the water, the drag force due to water, would push the fish downstream, but by flapping it can hold its station without any inertial sensing. And it does that via the pressure sensing. The, if, if for the control folks out there, the block diagram incorporates not only a feedback control, which employs uh, an estimation um, module based on the potential flow theory and a recursive Bayesian filter, but also a feed forward component, which uses an average model of the thrust that's produced per flap. And by averaging over each flap, we can predict what the frequency of flapping needs to be to achieve a desired flow speed. And the advantage of that type of design, whether it's in this context or another context, is that the feed forward term reduces the transient response to a step input, let's say in the reference speed. And the feedback term, provided that has an integral term, for example, will reduce the steady state error. Um, the feedback term alone would have a much longer transient response than the combination. That's a useful, um, uh, that's a useful control design that, that may be applicable in other projects as well. And in particular, the, the, the control itself is quite trivial. It's just a proportional integral or PI controller. The complexity lies in the estimation and the averaging for the feed forward term. Uh, we also have a control design that allows us to turn the vehicle at a desired average angular velocity. The instantaneous angular velocity, of course, is changing as the fish is, is flapping back and forth. But by, by, by measuring um, the instantaneous angular velocity and including that in the state space, we can now control not only the translational velocity, but the angular rotational velocity as well. And the, uh, uh, again, I apologize, I don't have a movie, but this is a snapshot of, a, of an illustration of that turning at a, desired, um, a, a, at a desired average angular velocity, which has the effect of tracing out a circular arc. And, and, and for path planning, the ability to trace out a circular arc means that we can treat the vehicle as though it were, is a self-propelled particle and thus apply tools from um, existing controllers, control designs for systems of self-propelled particles. At any rate, you also see here um, the, the vortices that are shed from the vehicle as it flaps, um, and those are, those are generated in order to predict the, the thrust that's produced by flapping. So that's another controlled design that, that we've, uh, we've done with the vehicle. Here are a couple uh, uh, 
movies that do work, um, I think, of, uh, of, of the vehicle operating. In the left-hand side here, um, we have, um, we have the uh, small 200-gallon tank in our lab in the Kim building, and you see two fish. Um, you see the, the prototype flexi fish, as we call it, uh, swimming next to a scale model. It's a two-thirds model of the fish that we have suspended from, um, from a, 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 a servo and, and uh, force apparatus that is a, a subject of ongoing work from a student in my lab in order to determine the optimal fra uh, flapping frequency given the uh, stiffness of the tail. And so that's ongoing work. I apologize for the, for the videos. I think the, the, the net meeting that we're running to broadcast to our uh, sponsors at IAI is causing my internet to slow down a little bit. Um, but on the right-hand side, um, you saw the prototype swimming in the neutral buoyancy facility. Let me see, what if I play one of these one at a time? Maybe it'll work a little bit better. Hey, Krishna. No, thanks for bringing that up. Actually, in both cases, it's still water. Yeah, so in the lab, we have this, um, this basin um, that we fill with still water. Um, it's separate from the flow channel that I mentioned on a previous slide. One of the things that we can do with this basin is create a single solitary vortex, like a bathtub vortex. Um, I don't know if you can make it out, but there's a drain in the floor, and we, well, one of the things we've done is to pump the water out of the drain and then back in in a rotating fashion. And I won't talk about it today, but for some of our experiments, actually, I will talk about it a little bit. Um, for some of our experiments with vortex sensing, we've used this tub. But in this video, it's, it's just still water. Right, so let's talk a little bit about vortex sensing. Um, so here's a case study of the kind of behavior we'd like to be able to do with this vehicle once it's operational. Um, and that is a behavior that fish exhibit in the wake of an obstacle or of in the wake of another fish. Um, a, a, a cylinder in the flow, um, if the flow is left to right here, produces this alternating pattern of vortices known as a Carmen vortex streak. And so uh, one um, control design that we're working on implementing, and hopefully you can see in the videos, is a, a, a design where we control the cross stream position of the fish uh, by virtue of changing its angle of attack and using lift, which is generated in a, uh, for an airfoil with a non-zero angle of attack in a flow, and use that to slalom um, or crash into, as the case may be, the, these vortices as they're shed um, and as they're advected from left to right. Here's a picture, again, it's a little bit difficult to make out, uh, but what we, we're generating the vortices using um, a, a, another flapper, so not the fish, but another flapper that's upstream that's swinging back and forth in the flow to produce these vortices. And so again, we employ potential flow theory and the conformal mapping known as the Joukowsky transformation to model the fluid flow past um, the, the Carmen vortex sheet in the presence of this air foil. And that, again, is essential for the feedback term in the model that employs the flow estimation. Okay, the control design um, is, is fairly straightforward. We have a second order system in the cross stream direction denoted by Y. Most of this is done in the body frame of the fish, so, um, so some of the coordinates are the opposite of what you would expect. But the point is that by changing the angle of attack, which is our input in this model, it per, in the, as long as there's water flowing from left to right here, we produce lift in the horizontal direction that, that allows the fish to move along the air bearings, which are now positioned in the cross-stream direction. And we want to move in the cross-stream direction in such a way um, as to slalom around these vortices like we observe in fish. So we developed a trajectory tracking controller that takes as input a desired uh, sinusoidal trajectory. 
So these are two sample reference trajectories that we've explored. The first one actually crashes into the vortices. You see here in this, in this uh, heat map of flow speed, um, the, there's a faint white line corresponding to the reference trajectory. And in this case, we actually maximize a property of the system known as observability. The observability is the degree to which we can estimate the parameters of this vortex street by collecting our pressure measurements as we swim. And in fact, um, to the optimal observable trajectory is one that actually collides with the vortices. And that makes some intuitive sense because the sensitivity of our pressure sensors decays with distance. And in order to localize the vort vortices, the closer you are, the better. On the other hand, what we observe in fish is, is, is actually 180 degrees out of phase with that. And that's this classic slaloming trajectory, trajectory just like a, a skier swimming around flags. And that's what we see with the fish, presumably because this maximizes the energy efficiency. So there's an interesting trade-off. We're agnostic as to which trajectory um, um, is better. The point is our feedback and con controller can, can track any of these trajectories within the, these, this family. And so here's, here's an example of it. Um, um, it may, again, may be a little bit hard to make out due to the quality of the projector here, but we're demonstrating the Kármán gating behavior um, here in the upper left. You know, maybe, maybe what I'll do, if you bear with me, is I'll just make this video a lot bigger, and we'll see if we can see a little bit better. So there's the flapper producing vortices, a little bit hard to make out. And then after an initialization phase, the fish, the controller turns on. And again, we're using the estimated um, position of the vortices to drive a closed loop controller, demonstrating the Kármán gating behavior. And so again, our hope is to migrate that onto our flexi fish. Okay, um, I'm going to move on, unless there's any questions, to the second of the three projects I want to tell you about today. Um, so now we're moving to the Caterpillar inspiration. Um, again, the link there was, was gaining our, some experience in fabricating these soft, flexible structures and applying tools from dynamics and control to produce locomotion. Uh, this, I should mention, is a collaboration funded by the Army Research uh, office with Carnegie Mellon um, and UC Berkeley. And so I'll be telling you mostly about the stuff that, that we're doing here at Maryland, uh, but I'll give you an overview of what we're trying to achieve as a whole. So this is a, this is a rough caricature of a Caterpillar-inspired robot that may have applications ranging from um, field robotics to search and rescue. Um, in its current configuration, um, according to this illustration, there's two levels of control, and this might be the key takeaway, um, namely the control um, that actuates the legs, and then a higher level control that actuates the spine. And then I'll show you some, some videos of caterpillar locomotion, and you'll see why that's relevant. But the, one of our uh, control questions is, is how to modulate the control at the leg level with respect to the spine level, if you will. Um, modeling the dynamics of these, of these actuators is a task in and of itself, and that's, that's, that's what um, uh, Professor O'Reilly at UC Berkeley is working on, um, fabricating these out of shape memory alloys. Um, these, these quadrupeds here, of course, are one segment of a multi-legged uh, caterpillar system. We always tell them more is better, and this is led by Professor Majidi at Carnegie Mellon. And our, um, our uh, contribution here is focusing on the distributed control aspects. We have um, uh, done work in, in the past on multi-agent systems and cooperative control for achieving collective behavior in those systems. And, and that's what I see when I look at this multi-legged organism or, or robotic design. We have an opportunity here for distributed control. So I'll tell you a little bit more about how we approach that, that aspect of the project. Uh, but first, let's take a look at some caterpillar motions. Very um, crudely, we can characterize them as either inching, as you would see here on the top here, hopefully, Again, maybe I'll just play one at a time, see if that fixes it. Um, 
So the inching type motion where the caterpillar grips with its forelegs and, and then grips with the back legs and straightens out in order to, to uh, just like an inchworm um, would, would locomote. Um, and whereas the crawling motion um, involves a bending wave that travels from the tail of the caterpillar to the head. And you see that happening here um, with a wavelength that's probably longer than the caterpillar body. Um, Got a little distract there. Keep walking, buddy. Um, and so, and so that that that's uh, we're actually looking at both both forms of of locomotion in our modeling. Um, with regard to the uh, the inching, we built a prototype. Um, I'll pause one of these. I think we're only going to get one at a time. Um, this is our prototype. Not yet inching that effectively. Uh, but it, it, if you can see here, these are 3D printed blocks with some soft 3D printed bristles um, that are angled on, on the underside and then a linear actuator in between. Um, and if the movie plays, you'll see that actuator creating an oscillating motion. Um, and the idea is that the asymmetry in the frictional coefficient between the blocks and the table produced by the angling of the bristles is intended to generate the forward locomotion via uh, the inchworm uh, model. And so that work is ongoing um, by an undergrad in the lab. Um, and hopefully we will, we will uh, be successful there. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit more, go into more detail on the crawling gate design. Um, and the crawling gate design utilizes a microfluidic network model. So inspired by the, the vascular system in caterpillars, caterpillars are filled with fluid and most of their actuation involves um, a hydraulic type motion um, within the body of the caterpillar, we got the following idea. We said we want to start, we want to create a traveling wave that starts from the tail of the caterpillar, perhaps with a wavelength longer than the body. And to do that, we imagine that each leg is a node in a network that's coupled to its neighbors. And so we're employing graph theory here to model that. And you might imagine the nodes arranged in a cyclic pattern like here, where the tail of the caterpillar is connected virtually to the head of the caterpillar. It's not actually connected in, in, in physical space. Um, and once we put it into this framework, we have what's called a network of coupled oscillators. Imagine that each leg is an oscillator, and, and since it's coupled to its neighbors, um, we can try to design control inputs at the node level that achieve collective behavior at the network level. And to do that, we started with two very simple oscillator models. In fact, um, only the RLC, for the electrical engineers here, um, it network is oscillatory. An RC network without the inductor um, is just a, de a decaying network. And so we've explored both um, the RC network, which is adequately modeled as a first order system, and the RLC model, which is a second order system at the node level. And you see a caricature here of a, of a circuit diagram where three RLC circuits are connected via resistive coupling in a circulant pattern. The last step here is, is ongoing work, and that is to leverage the synergies between electronic circuit design and microfluidic circuit design to fabricate a mechanical system that uses internal fluid to create locomotion. And the key is that microfluidic circuits and microfluidic circuit technology, including that done by the work of uh, Professor Sokol here in the mechanical engineering department has a direct analog between electrical circuit components. And so for, for resistors and capacitors, not inductors unfortunately, not yet, but resistors and capacitors and transistors can all be fabricated using um, fluid as the internal component rather than um, uh, electrons. And so to design microfluidic circuits, you can use their electronic counterparts and use electronic circuit theory um, to predict the behavior of the microfluidic circuit. And so the idea is that we'll then fabricate these circuits. I'll tell you a little bit more about that as we go. 
So with regard to RLC circuits, you may recall this is a linear system. It can be written in linear state space form where the states are the voltage across the capacitor and the rate of change of the voltage across the capacitor. Um, with regard to the RC circuit without the inductor, it's only a first order system. Um, but with the, with the inductor, it's a second order system, so two time derivatives. Um, for the mechanical uh, inclined folks like me um, who have trouble thinking in terms of electrical components, this is just a damp spring mass system. It has the same state space equations. And ra where, you know, rather than the resistance, inductance, and capacitance, we have the spring constant and the damping constant and uh, the mass of the system. At any rate, this is, this is a one model of uh, the node in our caterpillar leg network. Um, how we connect the nodes is um, represented using algebraic graph theory. So a graph in mathematics is a collection of nodes and edges, and it can be represented using matrices um, using tools from linear algebra. And there's a couple specialized matrices that um, that, that, that are used here, um, uh, and, and they are the adjacency matrix, which contains a one for every edge um, between the corresponding um, column heading and row heading. And so if there's, a, if, there's a, if there's an edge between node i and node j, then the ijth entry of the adjacency matrix would be one, and so on. The degree matrix is, is a diagonal matrix in which the diagonal entries are the row sums of the adjacency matrix, and the difference between the two is the graph Laplacian. So here are two graph Laplacians. This is the graph Laplacian of an undirected chain graph, um, which might represent the, the body of the caterpillar from the head to the tail. Um, and this is the, the Laplacian of an undirected uh, cyclic graph, where we've now connected the tail to the head virtually via the control. And so the, these matrices um, describe the topology of the network in a concise manner. Lastly, I'll mention that a, a large body of literature um, known as consensus theory, um, over the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen um, many results based on the following uh, observation, which is that if you write down a linear state space system in which the matrix um, the, the state matrix um, is a graph Laplacian of an undirected graph, for example, um, then this system will reach consensus, which is to say that um, the, the, the entries in this, um, in this vector here over time will agree with one another. The differences between them will go to zero. And that's what we mean by consensus. And in this case, we're talking about Euclidean consensus, although it has been studied uh, for systems uh, of angles which live on a circle rather than the real line. At any rate, this is a very robust process, and it's typically written down in first order form, although it's possible to have a system of second order, uh, a second order system that also reaches consensus, provided that we have this, this uh, form of our linear space, space, state space system where the Laplacian shows up in the lower right. So that's existing work that we're leveraging in our design of our, of our system, and that's broadly known as consensus theory. So here's the first order system in which each node is modeled as an RC network. And I want to just pause. I don't think I, I can't remember if I have another slide on this. I just want to explain one thing, which is this symbol right here. Um, so this is, this is an acronym for decentralized pattern generator. So centralized pattern generators are um, a concept that's employed in legged locomotion. It's sort of a master clock. Um, the idea is that there, if there's a master clock, maybe emitting pulses at regular intervals, then each leg can be tied to that clock um, in order to produce uh, legged locomotion in an orderly way. Um, where we've um, come in um, is we've added this lowercase d, the idea being that, in fact, um, if you think about it from a graph theory standpoint, a CPG would have an edge from this, a virtual node, the CPG, to the network, and it would be a directed edge. Information would only flow in one way. But if we added a, a, an edge 
let's make it a bi-directional edge back from the network to the CPG, then the CPG, the master clock, would actually speed up or slow down depending on the influence of the network. And that's what we call a decentralized pattern generator. So that's an idea that we're exploring in this concept. In this case, the CPG is this circuit here. Does anybody recognize this circuit? Any of the electrical engineering folks out there? I see some smiles, but no, I don't hear any guesses. This is an A-stable multivibrator. I had never seen this circuit before either, but um, it's an interesting circuit. It only involves resistors, capacitors, and transistors, so we can fabricate it using microfluidics, which is nice, and it produces a, a clock. It, it, um, it for, with a single high voltage, or in the microfluidics world, high pressure input, it produces a square wave output. It's called a multivibrator circuit. At any rate, that's our CPG. It's coupled resistively to a series of RC circuits which represent the legs of the caterpillar. And we can model that system indeed as having this uh, familiar form of that first order consensus. And if we don't allow it to continue to consensus, which is to say if we continually change the, um, the CPG as the output of the multivibrator, um, depicted here is the square wave, then you see the corresponding voltages of the legs, each leg, rising and falling depending on the level of the, of the multivibrator. And that's producing the kind of orderly pattern that we, we seek um, for the legged locomotion. Now this circuit actually is a little bit um, ahead of our time, I guess I'll say, because there's no such thing as a microfluidic inductor. Having said that, we, we did go through the process of designing um, a, a second order system involving RLC circuits, um, which we can write down in the state space form um, as shown here. Now, recall for second order consensus, the Laplacian only shows up in the lower right, not in the lower left. But by virtue of uh, an uh, input voltage here, at each node, we can design a feedback controller that puts the system in the desired form. And indeed, this is the control that does that. Um, and using this closed loop control, we put the, the matrix back into the form that is, has been shown previously to reach consensus. And you can see that with two graphical depictions. This one is, um, at time here is a horizontal axis, and you see oscillators here reaching consensus. Okay, and that's by virtue of this feedback control. Um, I will point out that this particular control, but the way the Laplacian interacts with this column of uh, capacitor voltages is it requires each capacitor, sorry, each node to know the relative voltage of its neighbor's capacitors. And that's the sensory feedback that would be required to achieve this control. Um, if you prefer a spatial depiction, here are, the, here are the node numbers. So there's five legs in this, in this particular caterpillar. And starting from the red line, which is the initial conditions over time, we reach agreement at the, I think the purple line is the, is the consensus. Bear in mind that consensus is not very useful for caterpillar locomotion because that would correspond to all the legs striding in unison. And that's not what we're looking for. But based on this idea, we can produce a traveling wave control. It uses the same philosophy. We seek a certain um, uh, matrix here in our linear state space form, and we achieve it by, producing, by choosing a control law, feedback control law, that renders the closed loop system to have the desired form. And this form, um, if you, this is actually a finite dimensional approximation of the wave equation the partial differential equation that we, we, we've all studied, um, or may, maybe most of us have studied in a graduate engineering class, which has a second order spatial derivative, right, and a second order time derivative. That's the key characteristic of the wave equation. And you see that here, because again, the Laplacian produces the finite difference approximation of a second order spatial derivative. And that's an observation that we, that we have from graph theory. At any rate, once we apply this closed loop control and we produce this, this approximation of the wave equation, if we initialize um, the uh, system with a certain um, distribution of voltages, then over time you see it propagating um, uh, spatially. 
And, uh, and I will point out that the feedback requirement here, the Laplace end shows up in the controller on the voltage. Remember, A is V dot, the derivative of the voltages. And so this requires that each node know the, the relative uh, rate of change of the voltages on its neighbor's capacitors. So that would be the sensing requirement to achieve this. Um, lastly, oh, I did have a slide on the DCPG. I forgot about that. So what is the role of the DPG, DCPG in the second order system? The role is to actually to provide a reference phase. Here's the, here's the network model that I mentioned. Here's the, the CPG node. Typically, a CPG node would have a, a unidirectional arrow to the network, meaning that information is flowing to the network from the virtual uh, CPG node, um, and it's just providing that master clock. If we add a weaker edge, in this case weighted by epsilon, from the network back to the CPG, that's where we have the DCPG, and the distinction is that um, if epsilon is zero, the network doesn't influence the CPG, then the CPG is shown here with this dash black line is providing a reference to the consensus and everybody matches that reference over time. In other words, the network reaches consensus and they reach cons consensus that matches the CPG. On the other hand, if we do weight um, this edge from the network back to the CPG, then we see that the, the clock will actually speed up or slow down depending on the behavior of the network, okay? And so that's, that's a more distributed uh, solution to this system. Um, right, so here's a picture of the multivibrator and its partner, the bistable multivibrator. Again, the point is all these components can be fabricated in microfluidics so that we can move forward with this design. And indeed, by working with Dr. Sokol here in mechanical engineering um, and, and, and utilizing um, uh, the 3D printer in the basement of Martin Hall, we can fabricate these components. Uh, resistors are the easiest, they're just tubes. Um, and these guys get a little bit more involved. Um, and here are some uh, depictions of uh, microfluidic circuits that will form the basis for our Caterpillar-inspired robot. Okay, moving right along. Unless there's any questions, I'll tell you about our third and final project in this area, Bio-inspired soft robotics. And this is the newest project started in January. It's a collaboration. Uh, yeah, Krishna. If I understand what you mean correctly, um, I will respond in this way, which is to say that the multivibrator circuit requires a high pressure input that comes from, I guess, the wall, if I'm interpreting what you're saying correctly. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It might be there. I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I know what you're talking about. Sorry. Uh, but, but what I will say with regard to input is that um, this robot would necessarily be tethered as a result of requiring that high pressure supply. And one of the goals of our CSTAR project, um, through the work of our collaborators at Harvard, is to try to make it untethered. But I don't think that's the wall that you were talking about. So, but it gave me an opportunity to say that within the device, in within the device. No, I'd like to learn more about, it, but I don't. It doesn't ring a bell. Um, and so this this is a, our CSTAR project: soft echinoderm inspired appendages for strong tactile amphibious robots. Um, starfish are echinoderms. Um, they have many different forms um, that are specialized for certain behaviors. Um, certain um, starfish are very 
flat, and that's especially well suited for burrowing in sand. Others um, have uh, very stiff arms with uh, long uh, tube feet. If you flip a starfish over, if anyone's ever flipped the starfish over, there are specialized feet that are driven by um, individual valves um, that are called tube feet. Um, and there are hundreds of them, and you see, you see them here extended from the bottom of the arm. Um, other caterpillars um, are, are specialized for defense or for high speed. And so we wanted to create an engineering framework using 3D printing of soft materials and some of the other techniques like microfluidics that we talked about to basically create a flexible uh, design that can be adapted to a particular mission um, in the underwater uh, environment. And so we came up with a, a layered approach, uh, again, collectively with, with Carnegie Mellon and with Harvard, um, that um, basically involves three layers of actuation. If you think back to the caterpillar, we had the spine actuation and the leg actuation, and we preserve that, and we add to that um, a specialization at the tips of the tube feet um, that we call the third layer. So let me back up a second. Here's, here's the con conceptual design of the starfish with internal batteries and um, control systems. Um, one of the key features, this is a zoom in of the, of the arm here, one of the key features that we want to emulate in, in caterpillars, uh, sorry, in starfish, even though we are designing a soft robotic system, starfish have um, internal bone structures known as ossicles that interlock in certain configurations to basically give them rigidity on demand. So it's a flexible system that can become rigid through interlocking internal structures known as ossicles, and that's a, that's a, a feature that we want to emulate in our system. Um, there's also the internal hydraulics or vasculature that's driving the arm motion and the motion of the individual tube feet. Um, we, uh, we then have thought about emulating the interaction between the tube feet and the substrate, but that involves very complex organic chemistry. Um, starfish actually ex uh, secrete an adhesive and a de-adhesive with every stride of their tube feet. And that's uh, very difficult in a maritime environment to create those, those substances. Carnegie Mellon is looking at it, but in the meantime, we're just using a magnet. Um, that's been very effective and may have applications for ship hull inspection and so on, on any kind of magnetic surface. Um, so that's kind of the overview of the three layers. And the work I'm going to tell you a little bit about today is in, um, is in the gate design. How do we make the caterpillar move? And for this, my postdoc, Will, um, it, it has uh, um, generated the, the, the following results just in a short period of time here. We're using tools from differential geometry. In particular, we're trying to relate cyclic changes in the shape of the robot, so periodic motions in the shape of the robot that create, um, that create um, motion in, in external variables corresponding to the position and orientation of the overall robot. And that's the basis for um, uh, for the design of robotic lo uh, locomotion. And we use the phrase shape variables to describe, let's say, the angle between the, the arms or the length of the arms and the so-called group variables uh, because of the correspondence between the position and orientation of the robot and certain lead groups having to do um, um, with, with position and orientation of a rigid body. Okay. And the key here is that we're, we're leveraging these results that exist and have existed for many decades, actually, to systems that have many degrees of freedom, soft systems that are elastic in nature, unlike the um, uh, traditionally rigid structures that are, have been studied. And so one such uh, flexible structure is a so-called NuNet actuator from the Harvard group. This is a pneumatic actuator, although it can be used in a hydraulic configuration as well, um, that, that responds to changing pressure by changing its curvature. And that's due to the structure of these bellows here that when they inflate, you can see how they, they swell and cause that, uh, that change in the curvature. And so we've, we've, uh, Will has created a system to describe this, We're looking at the curvature of each of the N limbs. Um, five are shown here, although N is arbitrary. And the position X, Y, and orientation in the plane of the, of the center hub of the robot. 
This shows the tip, the range of motions that the tip of a single leg can achieve under, under this pressure, varying pressure input. Remember, as we increase the pressure, we can change the curvature. And indeed, by sandwiching two of these back to back, we can get bidirectional bending clockwise and counterclockwise. Yeah. Um, this picture here? Yeah, I don't know that gravity matters here, top or side, but um, this is a, the blue shape is a rubber actuator that's being um, filled with air um, such that when it becomes pressurized, it bends. Correct. I can see your confusion, yeah, because these do kind of look like tube feet, but, but indeed it would be oriented relative to the substrate just in the way it's depicted here, um, so that the, the, the bending is in the plane. Yeah, that's a good point. Thanks for pointing that out. I don't know that I have a picture of the prototype from the Harvard group, but the magnets are kind of perpendicular to the bending direction. Yeah. Yeah, I hope my slides are consistent. But yes, it is. These, this is showing two different types of attachment points here um, that, that we've modeled. The first constrains both the position and the orientation of a foot. You imagine maybe this happens um, as a result of a very strong magnet or maybe two magnetic tube feet that are close together, therefore constraining both the position and orientation. Whereas here, we have two feet planted and curvature changes of the corresponding legs uh, create this kind of wiggly motion provided that we only have positional constraints there. The, the feet are allowed to rotate. So we've examined gate designs for both of these configurations um, and you see examples of them here. Here's a fixed foot walking gate where we're alternating legs that are, that are um, interacting with the substrate. And here's a kind of a goofy rotating foot type gate. Um, and we've analyzed, there's a whole family of these gates. But the key idea is that mathematically, the, the, the motion of the center of mass of the system can be described by the group variables G and related to the curvature inputs or pressure inputs by this, uh, this local connection here. Okay, and graphically what that means is that a periodic gate in the shape manifold can produce displacement in the group variables. And that's the, the fundamental um, design approach that we're taking um, with, this, with this activity. So let me just show you a couple results. There's a condition here that we can, um, that, that if, it, if met guarantees that the starfish will walk in a straight line. That's what we call the parallel displacement condition. Um, gates. There's a whole language here that Will has created for describing gates as a series of steps enumerated by M, which goes up to the number of st steps in a particular stride, which then is repeated for the gate. And it corresponds to the starting curvature and the ending curvature of a particular arm, and then the number of arms that you skip to actuate in that sequence. And so it's a very rich family of gates. And you see some examples here. We have metrics for evaluating effort um, in addition to displacement so that we can characterize efficiency. Um, here's a gate designed for rotating feet. Um, and indeed, um, what this slide shows is the additional uh, level of modeling that occurs if we start to think about these elastic leg structures as having dynamics. Because if they have dynamics, then we can employ um, tools from continuum mechanics to relate the forces and moments on the structure to the curvature. And when we do that, what we'll observe is that we uncover a fast time scale process that might be particularly useful for an otherwise slow, squishy robot. And that is a buckling instability. Imagine here two legs being inflated in such a way as to create curvature um, that sort of concave inward here. And what happens if we analyze the dynamics of the system is that there are two equilibria um, that are stable simultaneously, what we call a bistable system. 
And this bistable system snaps between under uh, uh, quasi-static change in the curvature um, of the arms. This, quasi this system snaps from one equilibrium to another. And here's sort of a bifurcation type drawing where we see that a slow time scale change. This is curvature incidentally here. And I think this is displacement in the y direction. And under uh, under, under variation of the curvature, we get slow changes in the y displacement followed by fast time scale. And, and if we continue varying the curvature in a cyclic pattern, we can do that back and forth. At any rate, we imagine this being useful for propelling um, the starfish forward quickly. And indeed, this is similar to, if not exactly the same as, a type of motion, locomotion observed in, a, in, in the brittle star which is a type of starfish with very long arms. Krishna. Does it depend on the end of the tube uh, that arms being uh, firmly attracted to some point? Correct, but not constrained in the rotation. But That's the, however, <clears throat> if the, so the end could feel some load when the arms are sort of driven. Yes. That's true. It's plausible. Yeah, we do um, have a model of it. And indeed, we're doing some experiments to, to validate the model. Um, so we fabricated in our lab these uh, bellows actuators working with Harvard. They're sort of a multi-step recipe to make these things happen involving 3D printing of the molds and so on. And what, we've, what Will has created, um, utilizing um, an off-the-shelf uh, uh, fluidic control board with actually four pressure uh, channels, um, is this two-armed system. And we have a ball bearing here to support the middle. And indeed, if I'm not mistaken, we have sensors there to measure the load and the forcing to get a sense for how. If, if, if you overcome the Ab absolutely, yeah. Yeah, you absolutely could. So we're trying to characterize that using experiments. Here's, here, I think I'm almost done here. Here's a couple of slides showing, showing that buckling instability in the experimental system. And these dots are, uh, have been added to, um, in order to use computer or image processing to, to automate the process of validating uh, the model and the predictions of the model in addition to measuring those loads. Um, so a couple other prototypes really quickly. The Harvard group, I do have a picture. So here's the, here's the five-armed starfish um, with magnetic tube feet. Um, and then here's, here's, a, here's a, this is a depiction of the, the magnetic tube feet. It's pressure act, actuated. And when, um, when the pressure inside this tube foot increases, there's another buckling instability, unrelated to the one I just showed you, where the, the magnet pops out. And it can be done in reverse fashion to disengage the magnet from the substrate. At any rate, um, that, that magnetic tube feet has inspired them to create this robot, which is called, I think, the circle bot. Um, and we just submitted this uh, to, to ICRA. And Will has done some really nice modeling of a gate design for the circle bot that I think I've got a video of, that by engaging these tube feet in a particular way, I guess this was the open loop, and this is the closed loop, and closed loop wins. So that's good for us control theorists. Um, and here's, a, here's it actually walking along. Um, now, I want them to create a wobbling motion, because sea anemones, or sea urchins, rather, sea urchins are echinoderms, and they have tube feet, just like starfish. They just don't have arms. And so and prince, and, and sea urchins can move. And they do it by reaching out with their tube feet and wobbling forward. And so anyway, Will, I'm wa still waiting for the wobbling video. So maybe for my next talk. Anyway, um, I think that's it for me. Thank you for your attention. Happy to take any questions. Yeah. Yeah. And would it be something that 
something where the more sensors you have, the better you can. Absolutely, yeah. So I I intentionally didn't talk about that because I had given a talk here not that long ago about all of that, um, and so I just didn't want to reprise that material. But but certainly um, one of there's a few comments I'll make. I mean, with regard to the that that system is intended to replicate the lateral line system in fish, as you well know. Um, and so one of the features of it is that we use pressure differences rather than absolute pressures. And the more pressures the sensors we have, the more pressure differences that we can collect, and the higher fidelity um, uh, signal we can observe. Because in a sense, we're integrating not only over time by virtue of our, our Bayesian filter, but also over space in the sense that we have an array of sensors. And so um, in, in some settings, we actually can model that as a, as a hydrodynamic image where each um, measurement, in effect, produces a pixel. Not a perfect analogy, but it would give us more resolution. Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think what the way I would answer that question, I guess this is in regards to sort of the third part of the talk. Yeah, is that um, is that this buckling instability and the tools that we've employed to understand that better, namely uh, continuum mechanics, are going to allow us to produce dynamic models of these structures. The gate design, as you observed, was, was um, produced ignoring the dynamics of the structure, ignoring the fact that it's floppy and rubber. But imagine you have a system where you can control the curvature as an input. How would you produce locomotion? And then when we add the dynamics to that, then we would, we would need a feedback controller to track the, the gate trajectory. That's the extent to which I have really thought about it. I don't know, Will, do you have any other comments on that? I don't want to put you on the spot, but <laughs> if you had any great ideas, now's the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.